Good morning everyone. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. May we request everyone to please rise for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. You may now be seated. Again, good morning everyone. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. And welcome to the 44th Gabriel A. Bernardo Memorial Lecture. We welcome all information professionals, faculty and students, and our friends who are here today. The Gab Memorial Lecture is an annual Library and Information Studies of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. This event is in honor of Gabriel A. Bernardo, the Doyen of Philippine Librarianship. I am Elijah Darjuan, a faculty member from UPSLIS, your MC for today's event. We are glad to welcome everyone to this highly anticipated lecture from a renowned speaker. Thank you very much for taking time to come to our time-honored event. So you may know we are also seen live on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash UPSLIS. That's youtube.com slash UPSLIS. We invite you to share our live stream for those who might be interested in our topic this morning. To those watching us online, thank you for, very much for joining us today. This event was made possible through the World Experts Lecture Series or Wells Grant from the UP System Office of International Linkages. We are grateful for this university program since it allowed us to host our world expert as our lecturer for this special occasion. To formally commence with our event, let us hear the welcome remarks from our beloved Dean of the School of Library and Information Studies, Assistant Professor Rhea Rowena U. Apolinario. <laughs> okay, I'll just put this. Okay, it's okay? All right. To our guest speaker, Dr. Michelle Caswell, Honorable Yolanda Granda, Professional Regulatory Board for Librarians Chairman, our former deans, Sir Johan Frederick Abab, Sir Igor, and Ma'am Kathleen Lourdes Obilie. Our guests from other government agencies, like from the Commission of Human Rights, from the Human Rights Library, and all the other institutions. Our faculty members, reps, staff, alumni, students, and guests, good morning. The month of March is a very busy month for SLIS. A very happy and fulfilling kind of busy month, I would say. We celebrated and are celebrating many important occasions. Last March 18th, we celebrated the 110th year of library and information science education in the Philippines. It was in 1914 when the first courses in library economy were offered at the College of Liberal Arts. It was only on July 1, 1961 that the UP Institute of Library Science became a separate degree granting unit. LIS education has come a long way and I'm very excited for what the future holds for our field. And to celebrate our 110th year, we held the Lib Rally, 
a contest among LIS schools in the Philippines. So it's like an amazing race with 10 tasks involving practical skills in areas of study, such as cataloging, indexing, management, ICT, records management, collection care, collection development, information literacy, reference service, and metadata management. Thank you to our students who participated and to our co-presenters for the event, the Council of Deans and Heads of LAS Schools in the Philippines, the Philippine Association of Teachers of Library and Information Science, and the UP Library Science Alumni Association. Another special event that we are celebrating this month is, ano pa? Women's Month. So the theme of this year's celebration in UP Diliman is Babae Tuloyang Arangkada Face Out Ang Pahirap Sa Masa. As such, SLIS held a special lecture last Wednesday entitled, Unprued and Empowered, Embracing Our Sexual Selves, with the well-known sex therapist, Dr. Rika Cruz, who also happened to be a member of the SLIS family. Why? Now, because her mother, the late Professor Divina Pasqua Cruz, was the former dean of the school. It was like a family reunion last Wednesday. <clears throat> the whole family of Doc Rica joined the event. Now, Dr. Rica talked about sexual health literacy and the importance of making informed choices regarding individuals' ability to obtain, evaluate, and utilize sexual health information. So thank you to the SLIS GAD committee for making our event a huge success. And finally, the reason we are all here right now is for the 44th Gabriel A. Bernardo Memorial Lecture. 131 years ago, on March 14th, a prominent figure of Philippine librarianship was born, Gabriel Adriano Bernardo. To quote what was written about him in the editorial of Manila Times on December 7, 1962, two days after his death, Professor Gabriel A. Bernardo, an unassuming man whose quiet manner belied his erudition, was one of the most beloved figures in the University of the Philippines in his time. He was Professor Gabriel A. Bernardo, Doyen of Filipino Librarians. Known to all students as the UP Librarian, Dr. Bernardo was actually an eminent bibliographer of Filipiniana and an internationally recognized authority of Philippine and Indonesian folklore. Upon his retirement from the State University, he devoted his remaining years to the completion of his lifetime project the updating of Philippine bibliography, where W. E. Retana, James Alexander Robertson, and others had left it half a century ago. A conscientious and devoted scholar, Dr. Bernardo was no less revered as an understanding and helpful friend of every student in quest of knowledge from the books and manuscripts in his care. He was a true man of learning whom neither adversity nor academic renown could distract from his scholarly devotions. In a brief, that is Professor Gabriel A. Bernardo, the man considered by Alfredo R. Rosses in his article in Manila Times on November 27, 1962, as the Dean of Librarians. And to commemorate his birth and what he has done for Philippine librarianship, we hold an annual lecture in his honor. Just a side story. When I was still in college back in the late 90s, hello batchmates who are here. Pakita naman kayo dyan. <laughs> the Gabriel Bernardo Memorial Lecture was a much awaited event, not only by the SLIS community, but as well as the other LIS educators and professionals. Even after I graduated, I made sure to attend the GAB lecture 
held every March of each year. It's also a wonderful opportunity for me to meet my former teachers and classmates and friends and colleagues in the profession. In fact, a while ago, diba, it's like a reunion of sorts. Diba? Pag umata, oh, hello, ma'am, hi. No? So it's a, it's a very good event, no? Reunion talaga siya. So we are all gathered today at this beautiful space to hold the 44th Gabriel A. Bernardo Lecture Series. This space, the UP School of Labor and Industrial Relations, is our temporary home for the past five years. While our much-awaited SLIS building is being renovated. We are grateful for the hospitality and kindness of the Soler administration headed by Dean Melissa Serrano. We are very honored to have Dr. Michelle Caswell, a prominent and prolific professor of archival studies in the Department of Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. She arrived last Sunday, Sunday night, and has been attending events here and there, eating here and there, <laughs> and visiting archives and libraries of her interests. We are grateful for UP Diliman's World Expert Lecture Series program through the Office of International Linkages for making this visit of Dr. Caswell in the Philippines possible. This year's GAB lecture is entitled Archives, Communities, and Liberatory Memory Work. It will discuss community archives from a U.S. perspective while also discussing issues of identity, representation, and power, and its potential to embody liberatory memory work. Archives play a crucial role in preserving the collective memory of community containing the stories, the struggles, and triumphs of generations past. They do not only provide us with a window into the past, but also in shaping our present and future. They play a crucial role in uncovering marginalized voices and empowering communities to reclaim their narratives. Dr. Caswell, in her book, Urgent Archives, and Acting Liberatory Memory Work, calls her readers not only to imagine a better archival space, but also to make it happen and to create places where records catalyze change, embrace the oppressed, and usher in new ways of understanding the self. She also argues that archival disruptions in time and space should be neither about the past nor the future, but about the liberatory effects and effects of memory work in the present. We will truly have a liberating discussion this morning. With that, I warmly and happily welcome you all to the 44th Gabriel A. Bernardo Memorial Lecture. Magandang umaga po at maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much to our Dean, Ma'am Rhea, uh, to, for telling us something about Gabriel A. Bernardo and underscoring the importance of this event, and even sharing your personal story. We truly look forward to a liberating morning. We acknowledge the presence of uh, our guests this morning, Honorable Yolanda C. Granda, the Chair of the Professional Regulatory Board for Librarians. Maraming salamat po sa pagdating. We would also like to thank our guests from other government agencies, our colleagues in the information professions, to our university librarian, Ms. Elvira B. Lapos, and our friends from the university library. Salamat po. Library directors and heads, librarians and archivists from all over the metro. Salamat po sa pagdating sa ating okasyon ngayong umaga. We also like to thank our SLIS alumni. Sabi nga po ni Ma'am Rhea kanina, she told us that this is quite a reunion. I see some familiar faces, some of my former students, and we're proud that you are with us in the information profession. Thank you for being here this morning. Now, just some quick mechanics before we continue. After the introductory remarks that we're having this uh, moment, we will be hearing the lecture from our ex esteemed speaker. We will then hear a reaction from one of our faculty members, and then we will be having an open forum. 
This will facilitate any questions that you would like to pose or any insights to share this morning. During the lecture and the reaction, you're encouraged to jot down notes and questions so you can ask them during the open forum. Certificates of participation will be provided for all those who pre-registered and attend today's event in person. It will be issued at the registration desk near the entrance after the event. Also, certificates of appearance will also be issued upon request of those here in the auditorium today. Again, the GAB Memorial Lecture is an annual event organized by the School of Library and Information Studies of UP Diliman. This year marks our 44th mounting of this lecture. It honors the legacy of Gabriel A. Bernardo, the first Filipino head librarian of the University of the Philippines, where he also started as a lecturer in library science in 1920 and rose to the ranks of full professor in 1935. He retired in 1957 as an emeritus librarian and professor of library science. A conscientious and devoted scholar, Dr. Bernardo was an eminent bibliographer of Filipiniana and an internationally recognized authority of Philippine and Indonesian folklore. His contributions to the profession led him to being given the title Doyen of Filipino Librarians by the UP LSAA in 1957. Our annual lectures held since 1974, wala pa po ako nun. <laughs> H. Reveal ba? No, joke lang. Joke lang po. Celebrate scholarship in the information professions and feature speakers who carry on Bernardo's vision and legacy. Gab dreamt of an ideal library for the university amid the challenges of post-war recovery in the country. He also engaged librarians to come together as an association and pursue exemplary professional practice. I am sure that the lecture today on archives, communities, and liberatory memory work will, will amplify Bernardo's values and ideals. I know you are all excited to hear from our speaker who flew over 11,700 kilometers or almost 7,300 miles to join us today. We sincerely thank the Office of International Linkages, UP System, for making this possible. To formally introduce this year's GAB lecturer, may I call on stage one of our faculty members in Archives and Records Management, Assistant Professor Jonathan D. Isip. Good morning, everyone. It is very difficult to introduce someone um, who most everyone knows, and you wouldn't be here if you didn't know about Dr. Caswell. But it is a distinct honor uh, for me to introduce our speaker for this 44th Gabriel A. Bernardo Memorial Lecture. Our speaker is Professor Michelle Caswell, PhD, a professor of archival studies in the Department of Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she directs a team of students at UCLA's Community Archives Lab. Um, I will keep this short since I'm sure you want to hear from Professor Caswell, but I believe um, one of the things that our dean has also not told you yet was Dr. Caswell's new exciting role as um, special advisor to the provost at UCLA for community-based scholarship. Um, she will co-chair and convene a new network of community engagement advisors who will help identify, support, and coordinate engagement activities within the schools and divisions um, and across the UCLA campus. So looking at community-based scholarship, looking at liberatory um, memory studies. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker, Professor Michelle Caswell. Thank you all so much. I am delighted to be here today. I want to especially thank the faculty for inviting me. Thank you, Dean Rea. Thank you, Ira. Um, I've had just a fantastic week here in Manila. 
and I'm just so honored that I was invited to be here. So the title of my talk today is Archives, Communities, and Liberatory Memory Work. Some of the talk is based on my book, Urgent Archives, Enacting Liberatory Memory Work, which is freely available to download on the Rutledge Press website. So it's open access and free, and I highly recommend that you um, visit the site and read it. So for today's talk, I want to answer some basic questions. What are community archives? What is liberatory memory work? How do you ethically engage in community-centered research with archives? And what are some examples of community-driven research? And in particular, I'll share examples from a project I'm working on that is co-led by two community archives called the Virtual Belonging Project. So I'll begin with some key definitions and a brief tour of community archives in Los Angeles and online. And I'll address some of the more theoretical issues from the book, like what is liberatory memory work? I'll talk about some general principles and protocols for community-driven LIS research. And I'll close with some more recent uh, examples that enact the principles and protocols from a community-led research project. So the two archives that that research is focused on are called the Texas After Violence Project, or TAVP, and the South Asian American Digital Archive, or SADA, which I'm the co-founder of. So I want to talk to you today about a world of possibilities for archivists, a world where archives of all kinds, so those affiliated with academic institutions, government repositories, and also independent community-based archives, are activated urgently for contemporary activism against oppressive structures. I think first we as archivists and, liberatory and, and library and information studies scholars need to look at independent community archives representing and serving minoritized communities for some inspiration on how to do this. But before I get there, I want to situate myself. My analysis is based on my experiences as an American, specifically a white American woman from a working class background. It is a very specific cultural context. But while my specific experiences may be different than yours or foreign to you, the overarching argument still holds, I think. I think we can have a really interesting conversation after my talk about what specifically is different and what is similar in your context here in the Philippines. But there are always power imbalances and inequities in any cultural or national context. So I'm both a scholar of archival studies and the co-founder of a community-based archives, the South Asian American Digital Archives, or SADA. SADA documents the history of immigrants from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, to the United States. So I still actively am involved in the daily work of SADA. On the one hand, I'm caught up in the world of research and publications and teaching at UCLA and co-directing a team of graduate student researchers at the UCLA Community Archives Lab. But on the other hand, I'm caught up in the micro world of removing staples and scanning and creating metadata and the macro world of dealing with donors and writing grant proposals and setting organizational procedure and direction through my work with SADA. So I wear all of these hats today. For me, those two roles are inseparable. My research informs my practice, and my practice informs my research. And as a scholar of archival studies, I sit on the cusp of social sciences and humanities. I both collect empirical data to answer questions about what is, and think critically and analytically about what should be. And you'll see both of those approaches reflected in my talk today. So I'll start with the basic definition of community archives. Diverging from centuries of archival thinking about government and bureaucratic records, the past 15 years or so has seen the rapid expansion of inquiries into what we now call community archives. The first attempts to describe community archives in the literature emerged from the UK. So writing in 2009, Andrew Flynn, Mary Stevens, and Elizabeth Shepard write, a community is any group of people who come together and present themselves and a community as such, and a community archive is the product of their attempts to document the history of their commonality. They continue um, that community archives are collections of material gathered primarily by members of a given community and over whose community members exercise some level of control. 
The defining characteristic of community archives is the active participation of a community in documenting and making accessible their history of their own particular group and or locality on their own terms. And I've highlighted here on their own terms because I think that is the most important aspect of community archives. So this definition is a great opening shot, but it requires some refinement in my current American context, I think. We can talk more later about what definitions might make sense here in the Philippines. More specifically, I argue that we cannot discuss the phenomenon of community archives, at least not in the US, without addressing power inequity. Here we can broadly divide community archives into two categories. Those that represent and serve dominant communities. In the US, there are some historical societies that are often invested in white supremacist histories as a way to maintain or increase property value. And secondly, those that represent and serve underrepresented, marginalized, and or oppressed communities. It's this latter group of community archives that my work addresses. We might call them more specifically minoritized identity-based community archives in which the history held in common coalesces around a shared history of oppression be that white supremacy or heteropatriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, ableism, and their complex intersections. Furthermore, I think it's important to distinguish independent community archives from efforts that are community driven or community accountable collecting projects located within dominant institutions like universities. So those efforts are really important, but they have different issues in terms of autonomy, independence, agility, and sustainability. So to be absolutely clear, when I say community archives, I really mean independent, minoritized, identity-based community archives, which is clunky and doesn't easily translate into an acronym. So I wanna give you some example from the American context. Several of these sites are sites that I place my second year MLIS students in to work as paid interns. I have a grant from the Mellon Foundation that supports this work. So I'll take you now on a small trip around LA. So this first community archive I wanna share with you is called La Historia Society. And it's in El Monte, California, which is a town east of Los Angeles. El Monte, until very recently, was predominantly a Mexican-American farm working community. So there were farms and many Mexican um, immigrants, children of Mexican immigrants, grandchildren of Mexican immigrants, worked on farms and lived in camps or barrios in El Monte. The La Historia Society was formulated, was formed in this space. The space was originally a storage facility for the city of El Monte that was given over to this community. And they collect things like high school yearbooks and oral histories and photographs documenting this really rich community um, that has been there for, for a century. Another example, and you'll get a sense of how architecture is repurposed often for community archives and the ingenuity that goes into uh, creating these kinds of organizations. This is the Skid Row History Museum and Archive, which is located in downtown Los Angeles, an area that for over 100 years has been known as Skid Row. It's an area that's impacted a lot by poverty. There are a lot of people who are homeless who live in this area. And the Skid Row History Museum and Archive was founded by two artists and performers who started doing street theater with the residents of Skid Row and then realized how important it was to start collecting historical documents to prove that there is a history in this area. Otherwise, corporations were coming in and knocking down buildings and gentrifying the area. You can tell that this site, it says antique glamour over the Skid Row History Museum and Archive. It's a former dress shop. And so they've kept the layers of history there in this building. This is the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. It's located in two houses. Chinese immigrants started coming to the United States in the 1840s and 1850s to build the railroads. The Chinese Historical Society repurposed these two houses and a garage, and they collect incredible materials. So they collect a lot of correspondence, legal documentation, but they also collect fragments of pottery soy sauce containers that were imported from China in the 1840s and 1850s that archeologists dug up around railroad sites in California to show that the community has been here for a really long time. 
So those are some community-based archives that are in person that you can go and visit. But there are also community-based archives that are primarily located online. So the Texas After Violence Project, or TAVP, is a community-based archive that has a, a digital presence primarily. So TAVP says they're a public memory archive that fosters deeper understanding of the impacts of state violence. Their mission is to help build power with directly impacted communities, centering their dignity, agency, and expertise to cultivate restorative and transformative justice. And a lot of the work that they do involves training formerly incarcerated people to conduct oral histories with other formerly incarcerated people. And we'll hear more about Texas After Violence Project in a bit. And then finally, SADA, or the South Asian American Digital Archive, which I helped to co-found 15 years ago with my friend and colleague, Samit Malik, who is the executive director of the organization. SADA is a post-custodial archive, meaning we don't have physical custody of materials. We borrow materials from families, from individuals, from community organizations, from university repositories. We digitize them, we make them accessible online, and we return them. So this is just an example of what community archives are. And I think the thing that unites all of these projects is the notion of autonomy. The people represented in the records are also the people doing the archival work, and they're also the primary users of the archives. There's a slogan from disability rights activists in the 1970s, nothing about us without us. And I think that's a really good slogan for community archives as well, right? So again, the community that is the subject of the records is also doing the archival work and is also using the records. So for the past decade, much of my research has focused on the importance of representation in archives, how vital it is for members of minoritized communities to see themselves in archives, particularly independent community archives that coalesce around identities. So those of you who might know my work might associate me with the phrase symbolic annihilation, which is a phrase from media studies to talk about the ways in which members of minoritized communities are absent, underrepresented, misrepresented, or maligned by mainstream media. So my empirical work showed how members of minoritized communities in the US feel symbolically annihilated by a lack of adequate, complex, robust representation in dominant Western archives. And the ways that independent minority-based community archives counter this symbolic annihilation with feelings of what we called representational belonging that have a major ontological, epistemological, and social impact on users. So we define representational belonging as the ways in which community archives empower people who have been marginalized by mainstream media outlets and memory institutions to have the autonomy and authority to establish and act and reflect on their presence in ways that are complex, meaningful, substantive, and positive to them in a variety of symbolic contexts. Representational belonging shows that community archives have a major ontological, epistemological, and social impact on users. So as one South Asian American user of the South Asian American Digital Archive said, the first time she saw SADA, quote, it was like suddenly discovering myself existing. It changes you fundamentally to see yourself represented after being symbolically annihilated, after being told that there's nothing here documenting your community, that you are perhaps the first and only ever, and that there's no precedent for you when you know that there has been. And I think this is true, and I think it remains true, and representation is important. But today I want to talk not just about representation in archives, but liberation and the way that archives can contribute to human liberation. Canadian archival studies scholars Wendy Duff and South African archivist and writer Vern Harris first used the term liberatory description in 2002 to propose new ways of thinking about descriptive standards that, among other things, quote, would encourage archivists to get in and under the dominant voices in the process of record making, requiring engagement with the marginalized and silenced. Continuing in this vein, Chandra Gold and Vern Harris later proposed the term liberatory memory work in a 2014 report for the Nelson Mandela Foundation to address a range of memory practices aimed at preventing recurrence of systemic injustice. 
writing in response to a global gathering of memory workers from post-conflict societies, they write, quote, the aim of liberatory memory work is to release society from cycles of violence, prejudice, and hatred, and instead to create vibrant and conscious societies that strive to achieve a just balance of individual and collective rights. While liberation will take various forms and make various demands and call for various archival theories and practices depending on context, liberatory approaches fundamentally center oppressed communities, using records and archives to invert dominant hierarchies caused by white supremacy, imperialism, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, and other forms of oppression. Such inversion is not aimed at replacing those currently at the top of the hierarchy with those on the bottom but dismantling the notion and instantiation of hierarchy altogether so that all humans can live more consensual lives, eliminating disparities in the distribution of life chances. I think LIS scholars and archivists have a key role to play in human liberation via liberatory memory work. And I'm going to outline for you today three important ways I think archivists can engage in liberatory memory work. The first is activating records for temporal autonomy. The second is activating records for the self-recognition of minoritized communities. And the third is for activating records to redistribute resources. In this formulation, liberatory memory work has three aspects, the temporal, the affective or emotional, and the material. And I'll briefly outline each aspect now. So the first, chrono-autonomy, and the temporal aspects of liberatory memory work. For many non-dominant communities across the globe, time is not linear and progress is not inevitable. Temporality, how we experience time and our place in it, is intricately bound to the liberatory potential of archives and memory more broadly. In order to liberate ourselves from oppression, we must first liberate ourselves and our archival practices from dominant constructions that view time as a linear progression. So dominant Western archival theory relies on this Christian linearity and enlightenment progress narratives. In dominant Western archival theory, for example, the record records a fixed moment in time, the past, that archivists intervene on now in the present to preserve for the future. The past happened, it's over, the present is now, and the future's yet to come in a line. This also, not coincidentally, maps onto dominant ways of talking about social progress in the United States. So the dominant narrative is the past happened with its injustices. For example, enslavement happened. Things progressively got better with the civil rights movement. They'll get even more better in the future as the inevitable unfolding of the American promise is fulfilled. This occurs in a line, a linear progression. Yet this is only one of many ways of thinking about time. Non-dominant temporalities posed by Hindu and indigenous American traditions, for example, Afrofuturist speculations and queer theories all challenge linear time. To give just one example emerging from black legal criticism, critical race theory posits that linear progress narratives are fallacies asserting that racial inequities are only rectified when doing so converges with the interests of white people rather than due to an imagined inevitability of justice. The incommensurability of cyclical conceptions of time from the global south with linear progress narratives from the global north have led the philosopher Charles W. Mills to call the latter white time. How do we liberate archives and records from white time? How have temporal tropes about records rooted in the white temporal imaginary become instruments of oppression in dominant archival theory and practice? If records are, in the words of Jeffrey Yao, persistent representations of activities that cross space and time, how are they transformed when time is conceived of as cyclical? What if records are not fixed in linear time, but rather shift across space and time as they are used and reused, activated and reactivated. So starting in late 2016, a team of graduate students and I did focus groups with users of community archives at five different sites across Southern California. 
What we found out was that for these minoritized communities, they did not see time as a linear progress narrative where things inevitably got better for their communities, but rather they saw time and time again cycles of oppression repeating. That the same oppression they're experiencing now was also experienced by previous generations of their communities. That history was repeating itself. And I think you are well too aware of this phenomenon here. Across communities and identities, users of community archives articulated conceptions of archives as spaces to connect past injustice with contemporary activism, forging what I call corollary moments through activating corollary records. Corollary records document recurring moments in time in which the same or similar oppression gets repeated. A corollary moment is a point in time with historical precedence where the pendulum swings back to the same place it had been before. At their most useful, records can be activated in corollary moments in the present so that community members can learn activist tactics and strategies and get inspiration to keep going. We've been here before. We've survived this before. We have resisted before, corollary records assert. Here's how. By activating corollary records, users of community archives are interrupting that downward swinging pendulum of time, stopping, if only for a second, reoccurring oppressions by learning from previous generations of community members facing corollary moments. To impose a linear progress narrative on these communities' imagining of time and records would enact a form of what I call chronoviolence. The users of community archives are constructing a new conception of time, one in which archives have the potential to interrupt and change cycles of oppression if they are catalyzed in the now. If historical time is cyclical rather than linear, as focus group participants suggested, traces of the past are not activated to envision a distant and uncertain future, but rather to mark corollary moments or reoccurring points now. In this way, records pinpoint the repetition of histories of oppression rather than discrete, contained moments on an irreversible progress march. We must shift the focus, then, of the archival imaginary from some future moment to the present as users of archives search for past corollaries to their current situation through archival use. Users activate, activate these records now, not earmark them for the future. The imaginary is not forthcoming, it's already happening. We pass the corollary moment from the past as we travel back and forth across time. So the temporal aspect of liberation, I think we need to build conceptions of records that do not rely on fixity, nor on linear progress narratives, that instead acknowledge how histories of violence repeat themselves, and build archives that reflect non-linear notions of time, reflecting what I call chrono-autonomy. We must not rely on some future that might never come for archival use. We must activate the care in the now. Secondly, self-recognition and the emotional aspects of liberatory memory work. The emotional aspects of liberatory memory work involve countering symbolic annihilation with representational belonging. The emotional impact of seeing yourself in history, discovering yourself existing, the feelings of validation brought on by accurate and robust representation. So when I co-founded the South Asian American Digital Archive, or SADA, with Samit Malik 15 years ago, our initial aims were recuperative, in the sense that we were trying to recuperate lost history, pulling them back from oblivion into the community's consciousness. Our work was also representational, in the sense that we are trying to increase the amount and types of representations of South Asians in the US. The first South Asian American congressman, for example, pictured here, Dalip Singh Sound. The first South Asian LGBTQ activists. The first South Asian American anti-colonial freedom fighters. Recuperative and representational collecting kept us busy for nearly a decade. And guided by a very broad appraisal policy, we discovered and digitized more than we had ever anticipated. I characterize these initial recuperative and representational collecting impulses as a form of liberatory appraisal. Clearly, experiences of seeing yourself and your community in history after being excluded or misrepresented are emotionally powerful. Nearly every interview and focus group I've conducted with the volunteers, staff, 
users of, and donors to minoritized identity-based community archives over the past 10 years confirm the emotional impact of robust representation after repeated and extended experiences of symbolic annihilation. These are liberatory feelings. It is joyous to see yourself robustly represented. This joy is inherently political in a system designed to oppress. Yet too often, recuperative collecting projects fall into a trap of respectability that is ultimately counter to the aims of liberation. A politics of respectability insists on collecting records that conform to dominant expectations about what a minoritized community should be. Filling archives only with celebratory success stories from prominent leaders can reinforce harmful stereotypes that blame oppressed people for their own oppression. These kinds of stories often pander to dominant groups instead of resist domination. So given this complexity, more representational collecting is not necessarily the result of liberatory appraisal, but it can be. Recuperative and representational collecting can be liberatory appraisal strategies if they are part of a larger liberatory project. Thus, liberatory appraisal is the process of determining the value of records in regards to their potential activation for liberation struggles. Contrary to the past century of dominant Western appraisal theory, liberatory appraisal considers the uses of records in making appraisal decisions and further asks whose uses and for what aims. In this sense, liberatory appraisal is intimately tied to liberatory outreach as it is only in the activation of the records that their full liberatory potential can be realized. Its undergirding assumption is that archives can catalyze particular kinds of use, be these political or artistic or activist uses, by modeling that use in their own practices and by targeting outreach efforts to groups engaged in liberatory work. Which leads to the third and final aspect of liberatory memory work I'll discuss today redistributing resources and the material aspects of liberatory memory work. The temporal and affective aspects of liberatory memory work I just described are little more than hollow gestures without the material aspects. We need to couple representation with material demands. So in the US, this means activating records for material reparations for black communities and the return of land to indigenous communities. Herein lies the tangible material answer for the question of what liberatory memory work can accomplish, nothing less than the redistribution of wealth and land, which in the US context is in support of black and indigenous liberation struggles. You all will have to tell me what that might look like here in the Philippines context. So back in 2016, I was part of a group of three American memory workers who formed a delegation to participate in the Nelson Mandela Center international dialogue series on how to use memory for justice in post-conflict societies. We issued a statement that advocated for a liberating theology for memory work. And I'm going to read a little from this statement now. The past was never singular, nor will the future be. In order to generate these futures, memory work should be dangerous. It should seek not only to acknowledge past trauma, but to repair it. It should aim to upend hierarchies of power, to distribute resources more equitably, to enable complex forms of self-representation, and to restore the humanity for those for whom it has been denied. The Mandela Dialogues inspired us to begin forging a liberatory theology for memory work, which we envision as an ethics of practice fundamentally dedicated to animating traces of the past for social justice activism in the present, and to envision and enact radically just futures. In our immediate context, in the wake of a disastrous American election, this means using our skills as archivists, public historians, and academics to end the state-sponsored murder and mass incarceration of black people and the continued genocide and displacement of indigenous people, to dismantle systems of white supremacy, to actively resist the oppression of the most vulnerable amongst us, and to re-envision forms of justice that repair and restore rather than violate and harm individuals and communities. And this statement has been a guiding light and a roadmap for my work ever since. 
So if archivists think outside of the confines of neutrality and the constraints of professionalism, we can be crucial for liberation. We can mobilize the records in our care regarding previous successful claims to reparation to show that material reparations are not unrealistic dreams, but have historical precedent. We can activate archives for material redistribution. That, I think, is the third component of liberatory memory work in my configuration. The temporal, the emotional, the material, they all converge. Now that I've laid out a blueprint of sorts for liberatory memory work, I want to address archivists' dual role in dismantling oppressive structures and building liberatory structures. To engage in liberatory memory work, we must simultaneously dismantle and build. We need to dismantle archival concepts, practices, and institutions based on chronoviolence, on symbolic annihilation, and on maldistribution. We need to build concepts, practices, and institutions that empower people from minoritized communities with chrono-autonomy, self-recognition, and redistribution. Activate records for temporal, effective, and material justice. But in the time I have left, I want to switch gears a little and take a step back to address what it means for academics to study community archives. Right? I'm an academic that does research with community archives. Academic research has done harm to many minoritized communities. How can we be sure our research in information studies does not extract from communities? So back in 2021, together with my friend Jennifer Douglas at the University of British Columbia, we brought together a team of community archivists to discuss the current state of academic research on community archives and to build principles and protocols for ethical engagement moving forward. We called ourselves the Researching Reciprocity in Records Collective, and we co-authored a white paper called Come Correct or Don't Come at All, Building More Equitable Relationships Between Archival Studies Scholars and Community Archives. And the paper is um, a white paper that's freely available for downloading. The conversation surfaced lots of tension. So community archivists described academic research as extractive, as exploitative, they described how academics can parachute in, collect data, publish research that never gets shared back to the community. It was a difficult conversation that first day. And then the second day, we collaboratively developed some principles and protocols for how academic research can ethically engage community archives. And these are the principles that we collectively generated. So a notion of relational consent or seeing consent as a gerund that can be revoked at any point in time. A principle of mutual benefit that the research should benefit both the community and the researcher. Long-term investment so that the researcher should be invested in the community over time. That academics should have a sense of humility that they're not the experts when working with communities. Accountability that academics should be accountable to the communities that they're studying transparency about who is getting what out of the work that's being done, equity, reparation, so repairing past harms, and amplification. So rather than dub an academic voice over the voices of community members, amplify their voices. And based on those principles, these are the protocols that we collectively determine. Be transparent. Respect community authority, expertise, and timelines. Community-engaged research is slow. We say move at the speed of trust. Construct consent as something that's relational and ongoing. Prioritize the safety of community members. Check in and report back regularly and formally. Give published research back to the community. So send copies of your articles, give presentations at community organizations. Give explicit credit. Acknowledge labor through compensation. And this was actually one of the most fundamental things that community archivists talk about, is paying them for their time and expertise. Bringing resources back to community archives. So academics have good writing skills. We can use those writing skills to apply for grants, for example, for community organizations to get involved in the work of community archives. 
And also, finally, take care of our own spaces first, right? So there are a lot of issues with universities. Work on rectifying those issues in our own spaces. So I think that as researchers, as we turn toward researching liberatory memory work, we also have to reflect on our own role, right? And have to come to terms with the harm that academic research has caused and continues to cause and disrupt those practices and really strive towards conducting liberatory research. And I'll shift once again now to, for the last part of this talk to show you an example of community-led research that tries to enact these principles and protocols. So community-engaged research is a set of methodologies that aims to counter extractive and exploitative research practices and instead build sustained and mutually beneficial relationships between researchers and communities, assert researchers' commitment to each stage of the research process as part of an ongoing relationship building process with the community, that recognizes that communities co-create knowledge, that enhances the capacity of communities to advocate for their own well-being, and that redirects resources from universities to minoritized communities. Community-engaged participatory action research seeks to engage most fully with the community in all aspects of the research process, from the initial framing of the research question to the dissemination of completed research. So an example of this, back in 2021, I was approached by Gabriel Solis, who's the executive director of the Texas After Violence Project, or TAVP, about conducting some research that would benefit his organization. So as I said before, TAVP runs oral history projects where people who are formerly incarcerated interview other people who are formerly incarcerated. Gabe was well aware of my own work on the emotional impact of community archives on users. So as I've discussed, the way that community archives fight symbolic annihilation. While this work on user impact was important, Gabe really wanted some research to talk about the emotional impact on record creators or oral history narrators on sharing their stories. So not just the users, but those who tell their stories for inclusion in an archive. So he asked me, to investigate further what motivates someone to tell their story for inclusion in an archive. How does it feel to be heard and recorded? What future uses, uses do these record creators imagine? Gabe wanted answers to these questions so that he can better serve his community and leverage the findings to articulate the impact of his organization's work to funders. He also wanted to know if it mattered if oral histories were conducted over Zoom, as so many oral history projects switched to Zoom during the pandemic. So collectively, we generated these research questions, right? These questions were generated by conversation, not at me as an academic researcher imposing my research questions on the community. So answering these questions fills an actual need the community archives has, not just my own intellectual curiosity. So we decided to band together the Texas After Violence Project, SADA, which also had similar questions, and the UCLA Community Archives Lab, my research team, to work on a new project, and we called this project the Virtual Belonging Project, which was funded by a three-year grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is a US federal government agency. We are currently in the last year of this project. TAVP, the Community Archive, is the principal investigator on the project, which means it gets the funding for overhead administration, not UCLA, and that reverses the usual power dynamics when universities and community organizations partner. So here are our research questions. What is the emotional impact for members of minoritized communities to share their stories or create records for inclusion in an archive? What is the emotional impact of the quick adaptation to new digital technologies, such as online video recording tools, due to the COVID-19 crisis on record creators? In other words, does it feel different to participate in an online memory project? And then finally, building on the findings of those two questions, how can archives, including community archives, develop new tools and methods that best meet their community's needs as memory projects increasingly go digital only. 
So this is the method of data collection that we have been using. So my graduate student, Anna Robinson-Sweet, who is amazing, has been doing qualitative interviews with people who shared their stories with these two organizations. So far, she's done 21 individual interviews and two focus groups. There are 29 total participants. She recorded these interviews with permission. We code the transcripts using a software called InVivo to generate new themes that are emerging in the interviews. We use really rich quotes to amplify the voices of our interviewers. Again, rather than dub our voices on to what we are finding, we want to amplify their own voices. The research is then used to design new participatory oral history projects for implementation the next year. And the research is presented back at community forums. So we're going back and sharing what we're finding with community members. And what we have found so far is that many people who share their stories with community archives, they do it first and foremost for themselves, right? They might think about who might use it or who might listen in the future, but it's for themselves, and I'll show you an example of that soon. That shared positionality is crucial for narrators from marginalized backgrounds to build relationships of trust. So you can't just plop in anyone, an outsider, to do an oral history interview. A good oral history interview is peer-to-peer. -peer. It's two equals having a conversation. Many imagine very clearly who will use the records they're creating and why. And they did not, in general, think that telling their stories via Zoom rather than in person mattered very much. And I'll show you some examples of what people told us. So the first has been published in an article called It Was As Much For Me As Anyone Else, The Creation of Self-Validating Records. That's a quote, it was as much for me as anyone else from one of the participants. So across both organizations, storytellers create records, again, for themselves, first and foremost. At SADA, record creation enabled storytellers to place personal stories into the larger context of their own culture, identity, and community. And for TAVP participants, record creation cleansed trauma and enabled formerly incarcerated people to wrest control of their own narratives. So a sense of autonomy through the record, which is really important if the official documentation is only from the police or from prison records. So I'll share with you some quotes from these interviews now. So this is a quote from someone named James Figueroa who talked about sharing his story with Texas After Violence Project. And he said, man, I teared up over just reliving my whole story, reliving different parts of my life where I kind of just pushed it down and I don't really talk about some stuff. That interview brought out a lot of emotion so that I got a real understanding of how religion affected me with mental health, of the different times violence did play a big part of my life, where it stemmed from. So there was a lot of emotion in the interview. You know, Lavinia, the interviewer, gave me time to kind of just get my thoughts together, but it was as much for me as for anybody else. So we can see how telling your story for inclusion in an archive can have a healing effect on people who do. And then SADA, record creation enabled storytellers to place personal stories into the larger context of their communities. And this is a quote from Dr. Manal Hassan, who was a doctor during the COVID-19 pandemic and talked about the trauma that she experienced treating patients during the epidemic. She said, I think telling my story was revealing because we don't often think of how our background or our upbringing or culture influence our day-to-day -day lives. I guess for me as a physician, I don't always think that it impacts how I'm doing what I'm doing, but now I think it does. I think it did shade my experience and what I took away from COVID not necessarily how I care for patients, but why, my motivation, my drive, and how I process the experiences as well. I think the processing part, you know, so much of how we see the world and how we view life and death is impacted by my religion, by my culture. To finally have a space during her interview, to talk about some of those things was really revealing. It was enlightening. I think it helped me process some of the things that maybe I was subconsciously thinking or inadvertently thinking that I saw and I had not expressed before. So again, telling your story helps heal trauma that you've experienced. For TAVP participants, record creation, again, heals trauma 
enables formerly incarcerated people to wrest control of their own narratives. And this is a quote from someone named Michael Savallos on sharing his story with a TAVP fellow. He said, you kind of let it all out there and the shock is over with and everybody can be who they need to be. I really felt I had to tell my story because I felt uncomfortable in my own body. I guess it was like coming out, like if I was gay or something. It's like, you know, I'm a convict, I'm a prisoner. It's just like a cleansing or a release. So again, telling stories has a profound mental health impact. We also found that records which were created in order to acknowledge and affirm life experiences of people who have been self, uh, symbolically annihilated by dominant record keeping practices, we call these records self-validating records. So at SADA, people created new records countering dominant and often internalized white supremacist silences, simplifications, and stereotypes about South Asian Americans. At TAVP, creating new records countered the false, flattening, dehumanizing, and often white supremacist depictions found in bureaucratic police and prison records. So the process of creating these self-validating records is life-affirming because it enables people, particularly marginalized people, to have autonomous control over their own stories, going back to that notion of autonomy. And I'll read you just a few quotes about this. So um, this is a quote called, we bounce off each other's vibe, um, which somebody talked about in their interview, right? That it was really important for them that they were being interviewed by someone who had the same experience as them. So in the case of Texas After Violence Project, someone who was formerly incarcerated. In the case of Sada, another South Asian American, particularly from a minoritized community within South Asian Americans, right? So these conversations resulted in really significant realizations and actions in the lives of the narrator or storyteller. And we call these peer-to-peer -peer oral history programs. So at TAVP, Rabia Kutab said, I did this interview only because Alexa, who's the interviewer, and I are very good friends. We met each other in our re-entry journeys and connected. And I think what I admired about Alexa is that she's such an amazing storyteller and she uses her narrative to empower women of color in this whole journey from incarceration into reentry and into higher education. My interview with Alexa was very personal. It felt like a dialogue. It was very conversational. She's my really good friend. So it felt casual, but at the same time we were shedding light into those things that oftentimes it's hard for people to talk about. The most important thing is we are survivors. We're fighters, you know? People who have been through incarceration, we know how to juggle our lives, right? I know Alexa, that's my friend, that's my partner, and that's my colleague. We do research together. I've done, my God, I don't even remember how many boot camps, webinars we've done together. I mean, it looks like we prepared so much, but we have not prepared. We bounce off, e off each other's vibes. So again, you can't just plop any person into a community and have them conduct an oral history. It has to be someone who has shared experiences. And we found this at SADA as well. This is someone um, named Kamala Kiem who told her story to someone named Michael Henry. And it was a project on Indo-Jamaicans. So people whose ancestors are from India and Jamaica. So a lot of Indians were brought to the Caribbean as indentured laborers. Um, and so this is what Kamala Kiem said. I felt fully comfortable with Michael and affirmed. I felt professionally we shared some similarities in higher education. So he was speaking my language and he sounds Jamaican. He looks Indian. He looks Indian to me. So I felt safe with him and I felt comfortable talking with him. Again, that shared positionality is important. So based on that, those interviews, we've come up with a concept, symmetrical intersubjectivity, which is the ways in which positionalities held in common between narrator and interview create the conditions for more honest, rich, intimate life histories to be shared and recorded. When narrator and interviewer have mutual experiences of marginalization, trust and rapport are easier and crucial. So again, in oral history, power matters, positionality matters, and peer-to-peer -peer oral histories matter. And then finally, a work still in progress, does it matter if oral histories happen over Zoom? And what we're finding out is for most participants, it doesn't matter. So this is a quote from someone named Surajit Bose on sharing their story with a SADA fellow. 
They said, I think that Zoom was a nice neutral environment and we'd all gotten used to it. A public place, I wouldn't have necessarily felt comfortable talking at the length and the depth of the stuff that I talked about. And if it were at my house, I'd feel obligated to make him tea and offer him snacks and make sure he was comfortable. It wouldn't be the same dynamic. And at his house, I wouldn't have been as comfortable either because I'm like, okay, this is a stranger. I'm a guest in his house. I think Zoom worked out perfectly. So based on all of these findings, we've made recommendations for the two community archives. To continue to match interviewees with interviewers who have similar experiences and identities, to allow space for emotions to be expressed and supported, to assess the impact of storytelling itself, and to outreach to specific users, such as organizers, to activate the records, and to continue with Zoom-based projects because they seem effective. Also to leverage these stories of impact on record creators to funders. So tell foundations how this work is important. Some next steps, we're awaiting reviews on one of the articles, paying it forward, the prefigurative politics of record creation. We're working on an article about Zoom. We're also working on a toolkit for communities to start peer-to-peer -peer oral history projects. And then both organizations are developing responsive projects based on what we learn with new fellows who are collecting new oral histories. So in conclusion, through all of this work with community archives, I want practicing archivists and library and information science scholars to ask what if. I want us to think speculatively. What if we let go of the oppressive concepts and systems and structures we've inherited as a profession and as researchers and imagined a new way of doing things? What if we continued um, to commit ourselves to abolish oppression in all its manifestations through archival practice and research? What if we used archives not just for more robust representation, but as tools for human liberation? And I hope that we can have a robust conversation about that now. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Caswell. Uh, several interesting points were raised during the lecture. I was taking down notes, no? specifically in the importance of liberation beyond representation. Aspects of liberatory memory work, kung natatandaan nyo pa po, there's three involving time, temporal aspect, emotion, affective aspect, and matter or the material aspect of liberatory memory work. Also, she emphasized that we should put the stories of our community members at the center of our community archiving. Again, I'd like to plug, please download Dr. Caswell's book if you're interested to know more. If you will be having also question, a question and answer later, but you could download Dr. Caswell's book, Urgent Archives. It's an open access book published by Routledge. Now, let us hear a reaction from one of our faculty members at UPSLIS to commence a purpose, purposeful discussion. Our reactor is an associate professor of archives and records management at UPSLIS. Uh, she joined the school in 2006 and teaches LIS and archival studies courses in both the undergraduate and graduate levels. She's also currently the editor-in-chief of the Philippine Journal of Librarianship and Information Studies, formerly the Journal of, the journal of Philippine Librarianship, the first and longest-running academic journal in LIS in the Philippines. Please welcome Associate Professor Ira Benrostro Kabab. Okay, finally, I'm really happy that the podium is here so you can see me. Because usually whenever I'm in the podium, no one could actually see me because, you know, small girl problem. But anyway, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Eli, for that introduction. And hi, Michelle. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ira, and I'm also one of the faculty members handling um, archival studies courses at UPS LIS. So Eli mentioned that I started teaching in 2006, so that's kind of an age reveal already. Surprise, surprise. So I have the honor to be the main host of Dr. Caswell for the Welsh program. And thank you so much for um, 
for coming here and for accepting our invitation. Actually, Dr. Caswell is one of the archival rock stars that, you know, that whom I would really, really want to meet in my lifetime. So my students who are here, here's Dr. Caswell. So he, this is, she's real, she, she's not an AI. So my students are actually reading your work, so thank you so much. And also we'd like to thank um, Assistant Professor Paul Jason Paris. Um, he's not here, he's doing his PhD um, in the US because he's the one who actually invited Dr. Castle to come here when he was in one conference. So. I, was, I also had been given the chance to, to accompany Dr. Caswell in, his, in her tours in the different archives and um, institutions here in Kazan City. And now I have the honor to give some brief um, response to your fantastic work. This is so much pressure on me. On community archive and of course different um, liberatory work initiatives that have already been done for various groups. So I remember that I also served as a reactor to Dr. Andrew Fleen's um, GAB lecture, also on Community Archives in 2022. So Dr. Andrew Fleen is also one of the main proponents of the concept of Community Archives. So he's also a professor at the University College London. So, but it was done via Zoom. So his talk was about activist archives, counter archives, and also the potential of oral history in engaging different members of the communities to uncover and address various silences. Basically, what I pointed out two years ago was the need to the concept of and practice of community archives to be further explored in majority of the countries in the Southeast Asian region within the contextual frames, understanding, and actual needs of the region and its people. Whether these needs are emanating from our sociopolitical history and situation, faith and religion, culture, language and traditions, domestic and gender issues, human rights and social justice, and other contemporary concerns. And this remains my concern up to now especially here in the Philippines, that democracy is so fragile and so is the collective memory of the people. And we are perpetually facing issues on inequality, inequity, and marginalization. Therefore, there should be a shared responsibility among the archives, practitioners, as well as the citizens to undertake various responsibilities and various opportunities, even how small they are, to be more involved in the continuous and continuous and collaborative memory work, critical approaches, and an open acknowledgement that archives are politically charged spaces for ongoing reconciliation processes, nuanced discourses and contestations, and ethical recognition of the unheard and the unseen. So without putting definitions of community archive, many helpful examples of approaches and mindsets on how we can liberate ourselves from the dominant traditions and practices that have been creating silences, not just in our archives, libraries, and museums, but also in our communities and how people understand, remember, and portray events and minoritized individuals. We should also acknowledge that the archivists have the power to both include and exclude. This is an indication that this power can be a double-edged sword that cuts through the limits of remembering and forgetting, revealing and burying and listening and also silencing voices and narratives. And that is why a lot of things matter in doing initiatives and projects like this, as Dr. Castle discussed earlier, including the relationships and identities of communities and individuals we are engaging and working with, as well as the different modes of storytelling and listening to these stories. So it is a common question among us um, trying to begin collecting and preserving our own materials, how do we begin? This is actually one of the first questions that people would ask me whenever they would consult me about preservation, description, processing their records. How do we begin? What standard or framework should we follow or subscribe to? We're always looking for standards and neutral practices objective methods, um, and while these standards are very helpful, of course, we do not undermine the use and importance of these methods. I myself depend on them. I teach them to my students. It is equally important to think 
about the ethical considerations in collecting and activating records to foster representational belonging, just like what Dr. Caswell mentioned earlier, and to keep ourselves inspired and continue our work in advo advocacy. I find it particularly special and relatable when Dr. Caswell mentioned about humility, transparency, community engagement, the emotional impact of records to their creators and to the communities using them, as well as listening to the stories and perspectives of various individuals in building better relationships with community members. We may not be trained professional, as professional oral, oral historians, but I would like to believe that a key component in doing interviews, just like in the projects mentioned by Dr. Caswell or in the projects that you would be planning to do someday, is, you know, more than asking the right questions, is the ability to listen. Listening is a very underrated skill and is often not taught in schools or research methods classes. Uh, we are often taught how to be good public speakers, how to efficiently frame and handle questions, how to draft your questions like one to 10 questions and ask your interviewees. But it is seldom that we focus our energy on active and attentive listening. Power is usually linked with speaking and expressing one's authority. But listening is also a very powerful political and humanistic act in the performance of democracy and human rights. Listening helps build trust and let us, lets us understand other people's perspectives as well as ourselves and our positionality with the project, with the community, with the, our own advocacy, and the wider issue that we're trying to confront or tackle. Listening therefore equalizes power relations, and humanizes archival work. So in that, Dr. Castle's lecture this morning, she emphasized that ar archival work is really about the people. It's really about the people, not just the materials. It is about the people. How we can have better engagement with them, how we can encourage them to particip participate more, because this archives is about them. It is for them. Just like Gabriel A. Bernardo, our celebrated Filipino librarian today, and Filipiniana expert. Um, he valued the resources that he collected for decades in the UP library, but you know, he valued the people he served and worked him more. In one of the writings about the life and works of Professor Bernardo, Versosa wrote in 1986, and I quote, Professor Bernardo did not allow books to assume greater importance than people. He paid much attention and care to those who worked with him. He had a deep understanding of human nature and an all-embracing compassion for people. So I hope that in the next coming years, we have students here, we have those who are still you know, building their own archives and libraries or even community archives in their own institutions or in their own locality. I really hope that we will see more human-centered, compassionate, and more hospitable community archives to be built and established in the country, wherein not only social justice or justice is prevailing, but so is kindness. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Caswell. And I hope we're going to have a really um, nice Q&A session later. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ben Rostro Kabab, for situating memory work in the Philippine context. Now, before we proceed, we would like to acknowledge our viewers online. Special shout out to Assistant Professor Paul Jason Perez, watching all the way from Seattle, Washington. Uh, you could check our YouTube channel. Our stream is still on. We also have international viewers as far as, as, far as Vancouver, Canada. Now we will be proceeding to our open forum to entertain questions and hear insights from our attendees. Uh, may we invite Dr. Caswell here on stage? And as I have the wireless microphone, you could approach me here on this side of the auditorium to pose your question. So uh, prior to your question, please introduce yourself uh, by stating your name and affiliation. Uh, the floor is now open for co uh, questions. Para po sa ating mga to all, to all our attendees this morning. I should be here. There's a camera here. 
Sige po, uh, just approach me please. Sige po, yung nandito na lang, yung malapit. Hello. Um, good morning. Thank you for the very inspiring talk. I'm from the College of Arts and Letters, but my PhD is in music. And my um, my concern is with the, it's a very material. It's with how do you sustain the, how do you preserve the material? Um, so you gave this very interesting three aspects of memory work where you have the temporal and then the emotional and of course the material. And one of the biggest, um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we see here is how to, because it costs money, yes. it takes a lot of resources to take care of objects. Um, so how do you, uh, maybe this is coming from a uh, relatively <laughs> scarce uh, field for uh, preservation, um, how might, uh, how might communities work towards that, where we are not so dependent on either the state or big companies or, or agents that can also be very oppressive yes. yeah. <laughs> in um, caring for objects. Yeah. Um, and also because I come from the art studies department and my career, we deal a lot with artifacts. Um, and the museum itself is also very limited in its capacity. So, I, yeah, I, sorry, that's a lot of, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, this is, that's my question. Yeah. So can you repeat the second question about artifact? Was it? Yeah, because, uh, so Paolo, here's my colleague. We work in um, the art studies department, and we're also very attuned to ma the materiality of, of things. Yes. Um, not just records, but um, art, art forms, artworks yep. that get housed in museums, but if you're talking about communities, they don't have those spaces, or yes. they don't have the they don't have the resources to do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. This is a really important issue. So sustainability. How do community archives fund themselves over time mm -hmm. to do the important work that they do? And it is a slow process, and it takes patience. Mm. So when Samip and I first started SADA, we were both working at the University of Chicago Library. And we first talked with the official librarian there, the archives there, about maybe doing the collection project as a project of the university. And they have a huge backlog, right, of materials that are not processed and they're understaffed and underfunded. So they said, okay, you can start collecting on our behalf, but there's no guarantee that we will process that, those materials unless you also raise lots of money to do that. And Samip and I thought, well, if we're gonna raise money, we'll just raise money for our own organization. So we incorporated as a nonprofit organization. We each pitched in $100 to, to buy server space and to do the incorporation paperwork. So we started applying for grants as soon as we got our NGO status. And we thought, oh, we just need one rich person to write us a big check and then everything will be solved, right? That's, there's gotta be some wealthy South Asian American in Silicon Valley who can write us the check. That still has not happened. We would love it, we'll still take that if that happens, but that hasn't happened. And then when we applied for grants at first, we were rejected. All of the archives grants said, community archive, this was 15 years ago, right? Community archives aren't legitimate archives. Digital archives aren't really archives. And also that it was a niche project, meaning that only this small community would care about it. Now there's a lot of racism embedded in that, right? Because we're all supposed to care about the Walt Whitman papers being digitized, right? But when it comes to a minority community, it's somehow too niche. So we kept getting rejections like this and it was very disheartening, very disheartening. The first grant we got was actually from an Asian American community fund. So it was easier at first, 15 years ago, to convince Asian American funders that archives were important than it was to convince archives funders that community archives were important. Things have changed considerably since then. But so after getting all of these rejections and doing all of this work as volunteer labor, 
Samip, who's really good at working with people, he's one of those rare people who's trained as a computer scientist but is also really good with people, started talking to community members and telling them about our ideas and telling them how important it was to preserve memory and then asking them to contribute materials but also to contribute money. And so what this has meant is that over time, Samip has just very skillfully built up a huge base of individual donors who give money to SADA, such that right now, more than 700 people a year give money to SADA. And some of those donations are $10. Some are $5,000, right? They range considerably. But a community archive should be accountable to its community. And whoever funds you, that's who you're accountable to. So that was a strategy that was formed out of necessity but it actually really worked for us. And then I would say in the past six, seven, eight years, we've been able to leverage that and to go to funders, to whether it's a federal agency or a foundation, a private foundation, and say, look, hundreds of community members have given us money because they think it's important, and you should think it's important too. And that's also where scholarship, published research, can do a lot of advocacy work. Because 15 years ago, people were saying, funders were saying, community archives aren't archives. Now I say, oh really? Here's 20 of my articles <laughs> that have a definition of what community archives are, right? So it's legitimate. We've shifted the narrative that community archives are legitimate. And so now we're able to get funding from federal agencies. The Institute of Museum and Library Services is the US federal agency that funds research and practice in libraries, archives, and museums. And also the Mellon Foundation, and I really have to express gratitude to the Mellon Foundation because they have a project, um, a program called Public Knowledge, and they have been really interested in funding community archives. So they fund um, some of the work that I do at the UCLA Community Archives Lab from the Mellon Foundation. Because if you get one big grant, or you have one donor, that one wealthy donor, if they become upset about something or don't agree with what you do or the stock market crashes and they lose their money, they will pull funding and the organization will collapse, right? So I think we need to think slowly and sustainably about funding community archives. I'll also add I'm part of another project that's funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services that's led by SADA, by the South Asian American Digital Archive, on earned income strategies for community archives. So there are four community archives that are part of that. It's SADA, Texas After Violence Project, um, the History Project, which is an LGBTQ community archive based in Boston, and La Astoria Society, which is that Mexican-American farm working community. And each of those organizations has, um, is working with a business advisor to help them build a business plan for an earned income strategy so that they can start to generate revenue that they can use to invest back in the organization. So often, um, grants are for very specific projects. Often it's for more work, right? You have to do more work. And often you cannot use grants to pay for the electricity bill or to fix a roof leak or any of those pressing needs. But if you have earned income, you can do whatever you want with it, right? And so some of the strategies that are being developed right now are things like craft boxes that will be sold to children, um, subscription boxes that have materials, um, educating kids about materials in the archive and also um, providing crafts for them, or um, speaking at universities and corporations and charging for that, being consultants um, and charging for that, and having a, a public events that are fundraising events. So we're trying to figure that out, I think, but it, you've touched on a really key question here because autonomy is related to resources, right? You need resources to be autonomous. Um, some community archives are very lucky that they've had founders who've then given buildings, but most do not. The ones that I showed you, do, you know, those are spaces that they're renting or that the city is um, temporarily granting them, but that they don't own, right? I'll also say, too, that funding is insecure at universities, too, right? So we've seen archives being cut time and time again 
So in some ways, I think actually community archives, some of them might be more sustainable than university repositories. But it depends. I've also seen community archives that could not keep up their work and that close doors. You know, I think there's a range there. But it's, it's a really great question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So for our next question, please. Uh, good morning, Paul. Good morning, Dr. Caswell. Um, uh, several decades ago, um, re we really can't deny that there was an unbridled optimism for technological development in both um, popular culture and epistemic communities. And um, the rising standard of living in industrial industrialized countries have rationalized this confidence. However, we also know that we uh, that technological optimism cannot be accepted uh, uncritically. And um, uh, one example is that in the Philippines, uh, the authoritarian um, regime or practices that usually transcended, transcended in the physical environment have now transcended in the um, uh, online space. So my question is, given these circumstances and the paradoxical nature of um, digital technologies and any technological in, uh, development in the context of human rights, my question is how can digital technologies be made emancipative or um, what are the ways uh, or what, on, what are the ways on how tech, uh, digital technologies can be uh, made emancip emancipative in the ambit of um, human rights and memor memory work advocacy? Thank you. That is a really great and big question, right? I think we need to think very carefully about our deployment of technologies. So I've showed you two examples of community archives that are digital primarily and that primarily interact with community members, with creators of records, with users online through their websites. But I also know many community archives that don't have any digital presence or have a very limited digital presence. Sometimes it's because they don't have the resources or the expertise to do that. But often it's because they know that once you put something online, you lose control over it, right? And so if your primary reason for existing is autonomy, putting something online, you then give up part of that autonomy because you ultimately don't know how someone will use digital materials. And so community archives, I think, think very thoughtfully and try to balance the needs of their community, the promise that access can provide online versus the perils, the dangers of opening your community up to surveillance or to um, appropriation. And when you are, when the concerns outweigh, when the costs outweigh the benefits of refusal, right? Saying no, we won't participate. And so I think it's really important to be nuanced when we talk about representation, because in some cases, yes, representation can be liberatory. In other cases, it can be a trap. It can be dangerous, right? And so knowing when that is, knowing the difference between representation as a liberatory expression of self-representation and knowing when actually representation, again, opens your vulnerable communities up to further surveillance and harm. It's not always easy, right, to tell the difference between those two things. I think it's something that the archivists at the Texas After Violence Project have really thought a lot about because once stories are made public, again, they can be used in all kinds of ways. So I'm, on the one hand, optimistic that if we can figure out ways to use technologies to meet the needs of our communities and not just um, increase profits to corporate shareholders, you know, there are ways that we can do that, but also I think refusal is a really powerful tool as well, and that one that we have to deploy rather than, um, you know, think that we always need to participate and digitize everything and interact with all of our users online. I think we need to think about that more carefully. There's a really good example in the US context of software called Mukutu, M-U-K-U-R-T-U, which was developed by Kim Kristen, who's an anthropologist in Washington. 
and it is a digital technology that enables indigenous communities. So it's uh, create, originally created to work with indigenous communities in Australia, but is increasingly being deployed by indigenous communities in the US and also beyond that, communities that work with human rights records, communities that work with LGBTQ information, for example. It's a digital platform that enables preferential layers of access so that you can provide digital content, but that it's not necessarily open to everybody online, right? You can determine, oh, if you're a member of the community, you can have the password. Um, and so I think that's important too, rather than thinking about providing open access to everything. In some cases, maybe you do want everything or some things to be accessible, but in other cases, we need to scale it back. So I guess not rushing in to the use of technologies and also really investigating the corporate interests, right? So I often will talk to people who are just starting community archives and say, oh yeah, we have a community archive. It's all on our Instagram page or it's all on our Facebook page. And, the archivist in me cringes about that, right? Because we know that there's no preservation commitment. Those digital materials will be preserved only as long as they're profitable to shareholders. So I think we also need to educate the public about that too, because I think a lot of people don't fully realize that, although awareness of that is growing, right? But again, just being very strategic, like yes, you might put, um, a digitized record on Instagram as a form of outreach or um, marketing, but it's not an archive in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking critically there. And that's where our role as trained archivists is really important. I think we have a lot of advocacy work we can do in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Caswell. May we have our next question, please? Reminder lang po, kindly introduce yourself and stay here. Uh, when you post your question. Good morning, Dr. Caswell. Uh, your uh, lecture was mind-blowing. Thank you. I represent uh, Bantayog ng Mga Bayani Foundation. And with me is an entire community, thousands of a generation that went through dictatorship. As you were talking, uh, I'd like to focus my question on the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, work of doing yeah. oral history. Um, since you were open to doing Zoom. I was wondering about the quality of interviews yep. of people doing peer-to-peer. -peer. Yes. That's it. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much for your work. I have really got so much out of my visit with you and the people who work with you. It's, the work you're doing is incredible work. I was so inspired by it. So for peer-to-peer -peer oral histories that happen over Zoom, there needs to be training, there needs to be relationship building. So again, even if someone has a shared identity, you can't just plop them down, right? You have to bake in what I call a feminist ethics of care into the work, right? And so you have to train the, um, the interviewers first, right? Because if they have, if you're looking at records documenting traumatic events, if you're talking peer-to-peer -peer interviews, then the interviewers have also experienced trauma, right? And so they need a set of skills and some training about how to deal with their own trauma and how the work might bring up those traumatic feelings for them. And they need support too, psychological support in doing this work. They also need to know that the work is slow. It moves at the speed of trust. I've heard of some projects, which I think are harmful projects, where oral historians are given quotas, where they say, you know, you must collect one oral history about this incredibly traumatic event every day for a year without any break. I think that is really harmful, right? So we need to think about this work as slow work. And so you need to build relationships first with the interviewers, and then using their own relationships recruit participants, right? Recruit narrators through those relationships. And again, centering care in the work is the most important thing at every aspect. So it cannot be an extractive, here's the Zoom link, 
I'm just gonna, I've never met you before. I wanna hear your most traumatic moments. I wanna extract them and put them online for everyone to see. We cannot do that, you, 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 know, you know that, right? It is a process of baking care into every aspect, right? Into all of the conversations, into building relationships. Often those relationships happened, you know, over tea, over food, in person. But it was quite surprising to me, actually, to hear from narrators that that same kind of relationship, if intentionally built, can be formed online. Also, the process doesn't stop when the record button is over. So Texas After Violence Project, what they do is after doing an interview, there's a transcript that is generated. They then go back to the narrator and give them the transcript and say, is there anything in this transcript that you want to uh, omit or delete or redact? Is there anything that you don't want to be made publicly available? Do you want it to be made available at all right now? So they give narrators time to make decisions. And sometimes narrators say, yeah, sure, put it online. And other times narrators say, you know what, I changed my mind. I don't want it to be online, right? And so there has to be this consent as a gerund again, like this constant relationship of checking in. They also offer support for um, the narrators and the interviewers, psychological support, and for staff as well, right? They also perform, um, searches for legal risk in all of the transcripts because they don't want anyone to say any incriminating information that could open them up to further police surveillance or further legal action, right? Um, but it is an ongoing process of relationship building, right? It certainly does not end when you press, you know, stop recording on the Zoom, mm -hmm. right? And it changes over time. It changes over time, right? So as people reflect on telling their story, as they move through their own lives, as the political situation changes, information that someone wants public right now in a curtain, current political context, a couple of years from now, might not be safe, right? And so you have to keep those relationships going and periodically check in and respond and care. No. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you so much, Dr. Caswell. Just to let you know, there uh, is around five to six people still waiting for their turn for their questions, and we have limited time. So let's accommodate the next one, please. Again, state your name and kindly stay here as you uh, wait for your question to be answered. Uh, good morning. I'm Simon Filipar Sacramento from East Avenue Medical Center. I graduated LAS, then I went to medicine. <laughs> um, anyway, um. I'll contextualize a bit first, quickly. Um, so in the Philippines, for example, if you go to the communities, there's a very big risk of you being red-tagged, basically labeled a terrorist. Then you're most likely going to be extrajudicially killed. And the other... So with these kinds of problems, with these overwhelming odds, alongside problems like most people don't have access to the internet. We don't have, most people don't know how to operate Zoom. Just the other day, I had a patient was, who was an indigenous person, didn't have any records, couldn't navigate the bureaucracy of the city. No. Basically, they didn't ac exist as far as the state is concerned. So in the face of such overwhelming odds and in the face of a problem that is not just a lack of funding but active state violence and threat to life, how would you establish liberatory memory work? How would you establish a community archives when there's a real risk to your life, when the problems are so overwhelming? Yeah. That's a really big question, and I think it's not one that I can answer from my vantage point, right? I think there are certainly models here, right? So the previous question was just from someone who I think is providing such a fantastic model of doing the work in the face of risk, real risk, right? But I don't think that's something that I can answer because my context is so different. I mean, there, I, there is certainly risk that I've incurred and I've experienced harassment, but it's nothing compared to what you are facing here. So um, I, I can't answer that question, but I encourage you to reach out to people who are working in this context to get answers to that question. Thank you very much. Now let's move forward with our next question. 
Good morning, Dr. Caswell. I'm Grace Benaventura. I'm the librarian of the UP Center for Ethnomusicology. We are an archive, a library, and an instrumenta instrumentarium, and we have thousands of materials of indigenous nature. Um, so I have a comment and a question. Um, I wanted to comment immediately about the, your, com your remarks about difficulty in getting funding because um, we, I'm working with Ms. Ayara and Sir Martin uh, on a community archive, and now I've had the support of my institution. Um, but fortunately, in the Philippine context, we have under the National Commission for Culture and the Arts a committee for archives. So at the very least, we have a voice in the government saying that archives are important. Although right now, I think I just need to reframe my proposal so that it gets accepted. <laughs> so that's my one comment. Now, for my question, it's actually a little bit funny because as the librarian of the UP Center for Ethnomusicology handling indigenous materials and then working on a, a community archive, I find myself in a funny position between gatekeeping materials from being uh, exploit. We are really strict in letting people access the indigenous materials in our collection. And then at the same time, we're working with an indigenous community in, um, and, and engaging with them. So it's a constant shift in mindset for me. Yep. Um, so I wanted to connect it somehow with this question. But <laughs> anyway, my question is out of curiosity. Of course, there's power in giving back uh, materials to the community. Um, I was curious on what your thoughts are about repatriating copies to communities and not the originals. I yes. think that's just my question. Yeah. Thank you. So I think it depends on context, right? But I think in general, copies are copies. They're not the original, right? There's symbolic value of having the original. Ownership of the original is really important. And so I think if universities are all about access, they can have the copies, right? That's, you know, as long as the source community agrees to that, right? Because that's a way of providing access. But I think repatriating the original physical object to source communities is really important. And that digital copies, any kind of copies, are, they're not the same. Um, but again, it really depends on context, so it's hard to say you know, overall. Yes, I think um, I ask that because uh, the originals were recorded in, uh, how do you call this, outdated formats right now. So uh, there's no way to sustain such a material uh, outside, right now at least, at the very least, outside of uh, the traditional archive. But there's hope, of course, that when community archives um, develop further, they will have the facilities to, to accommodate these kinds of materials and therefore in the future maybe yeah. it can be the reverse, yeah. like what you said. I mean, I think that all of the work, again, needs to be guided by care and by listening, right? And yeah. so it's hard to say, like, here's what everyone should do in every context. I think instead it's going to be a process of asking and listening and responding and caring about what the responses are, right? So there's not going to be a single solution, um, but centering care, centering people, as Ira said, right, like, rather than the objects. The objects are only as important as they enable people <laughs> to do things, so, no. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe can we have the next question, please? Hello. Uh, Hello, my name is uh, Christelle. I'm an MLI MLIS graduate student here. I'm also one of Mam Ira's students that uh, encountered your work as um, one of our readings in class. Um, I'm part of a project now called the Philippine Labor Movement Archive. So it's, uh, it uses the community archive framework to try to document um, workers' experiences during martial law 
And its urgency came from um, the victory of the son of the dictator as president in 2022. So my question, uh, I was interested in the material aspect of liberatory memory work, uh, specifically the re redistribution of materials. Um, I also took note of something else that you said, that there is potential for liberatory memory work outside of the confines of professionalism in LIS. Yep. So one of our struggles as a community archive with small staff, um, little to no funding, and with staff that um, have also have little to no formal training on LIS is how to liberate materials without um, being limited by um, concerns about copyright, intellectual property rights, yep. ownership of materials, because our context is also that we receive um, donations of materials that don't have a lot of information where they come from, they're grouped together from different periods of time, yep. but um, it's still a big struggle for us. It's not a matter of doing away with these structures of yep. Um, finding out the sources of the material, but yeah. maybe how to do it faster so that yeah. the materials can be used now because there is an urgent campaign now for yeah. workers and for remembering martial law yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Um, I think this is a constant process of negotiation, right? Because those of us who have MLIS degrees who are trained in dominant Western record-keeping practices, there are times when those practices do real harm and where those practices were designed to concentrate power among elite, right? And there are also times when those practices are actually helpful and actually do meet the needs of minoritized communities. And I think you, um, it's sometimes very challenging to know the difference. And the only way that you can know the difference is to ask questions and listen, mm. right? And in some cases, it's like you're reinventing the wheel because, th again, those dominant practices aren't going to work for a lot of minoritized communities. In some cases, some of the practices do, right? So I think it's, it's this negotiation of, um, you know, here's the, the knowledge that I've gained through my professional education, but also I'm humble and I have humility and I ask questions and listen because sometimes those dominant practices don't meet the needs or don't meet the worldview or the culture or the philosophy or the ways of being in the world of the community that you're working with, mm -hmm. right? But it's hard to know, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Thank you. And, well, here's where I think, you know, a per, like having camaraderie, having associations with other archivists is really important. So there's a group that has now formed in the United States called the Community Archives Collaborative. And it's a collective of community-based archives. And the idea is that they will provide training. So how do you write a grant proposal? How do you digitize? How do you create metadata? Um, but it's up to each community archive to decide if that training is actually useful in meeting their need or not, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's have another question from our audience. So, hello, po. my name is Marielle, and I am a uh, library information scientist freshman from this university and I'm just curious you mentioned that you're creating a toolkit to start archiving and I'm wondering how can you recommend encouraging others to start archiving especially since today it's very hard to earn so the mindset is how to make everything as profitable as possible uh. so I wanted to see how you would be able to encourage others to see the value in archiving thank you um, I think through the research that I've been doing, the quotes speak volumes, right? So when someone says, I went to the National Archives and I went looking for community members and I just found records of death and dying and prison records that dehumanized us and I felt horrible and I wanted to cry when I left, like that to me speaks volumes to show that 
the dominant institutions are often failing people, right? And then when someone says to me, when I went to SADA, right, it was like suddenly discovering myself existing, or someone who participated in an oral history project with SADA, the project was on queer Bangladeshi migrants. Someone said, well, after telling my story to the narrator, who was also a queer Bangladeshi migrant, I decided to apply for asylum status because I realized that I could do that. Well, that is a massive story of impact, right? Like, wow, just telling your story resulted in someone changing their legal immigration status is huge. So I think communicating these stories of value and of impact beyond the standard measures of how many people walk through the door, or how many dissertations were written about the collection, I think speaks volumes, right? But I think if you're communicating with someone who's only interested in profit, I'm not, I'm not sure that's the right audience mm -hmm. <laughs> for this, right? Because the, um, the impacts are not about monetization. You know, they're about care, about um, changing the world, about being more equitable. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. We now we still have time for several more questions, please. Hello, my name is Carl Castro. I'm from the Department of Fine Arts at the Ateneo de Manila. Um, I have two questions, and they're kind of related. Um, and they're both about navigating the field as a creative and um, as an outsider. Uh, my first question is, uh, you mentioned uh, rules of engagement regarding community um, engagement. Uh, can you share more about the rules when you incorporate uh, or transform the archives into art making? Yeah. Um, because my, in my work as an artist and a book designer, uh, I work with art making and exhibition making with the strong archival dimensions, I want to ask. Okay. Yeah. My next question is, um, how do you also navigate these communities and fields when you're an outsider from either the community itself yeah. or from the experience. Um, I'm asking because I usually work with um, people who, like for example, are indigenous women or Muslim women, um, people who in, um, experience human rights violations, and all of those are not my personal experience, yet I remain committed to doing that kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Both really fantastic big questions, right? So. Um, the first question about artistic output, I would say those same principles can be in place, just tweaked a little bit to reflect um, creative output, right? So um, rather than, it's related to the second question, right? Going in as an outsider, extracting what you need, and then exploiting that information to create works of art that then go live in a gallery and are never accessible to the people that they're about that's a harmful extractive practice, right? But you can certainly produce community engaged art where you're working with community members. Perhaps you're not the only one creating art, perhaps you're leading workshops where others are creating art, you're presenting your work back to community members. So I think those principles can be applied in that context. I think specifically with archival material, with South Asian American Digital Archive, we've had a few projects that are artist in residency projects where we've commissioned South Asian American artists to create new works of art based on materials in the archive. And that personally was some of the most gratifying work I've ever done to see, you know, a lot of the archival work is not glamorous, right? It's like alone in my office, scanning things at night, getting you know dust on my fingertips like by myself to see something that i digitize be activated to create a new song or a new dance or a new video installation is incredible and reaches so many more people right the audience is so much bigger so many people who would never step foot in an archive are then all of a sudden really interested in seeing you know the art um, that's using the materials. And so I think there's a real potential there um, for the artistic activation um, of archives to bring in new people and really um, 
activate the records for contemporary needs. And so I think that's really important. There are ways that archives can encourage it with funding. Of course, it all boils down to funding, right? But um, having artists in residency programs, having artistic workshops, getting community members involved. Also, there is a risk from the archival perspective. Once you open up archives to artists, you don't control the art that they produce. Mm -hmm. And that's a risk you just have to accept, you know? Um, and then your second question about being an outsider is also an extremely good question. I always say, you know, transparency, right? So I'm very honest and open at the very beginning who I am, right? And what I'm getting out of it. I'm an academic. I have tenure now, but I needed to publish research to get to, you know, to be very open about what your interests are and what, what the benefits are to you. But then also humility is really important too. So listening and knowing that it takes time, moving at the speed of trust and being invited in. That's the other thing is that slowly building trust over time and then being invited in to spaces where you're an outsider um, is key. It takes, it takes time. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is LK. I'm also from the arts, uh, from the Department of Art Studies, but I got into your work because of Prof. Ira. She showed us um, your ar archiving the unspeakable uh, about Tuol Sleng in Cambodia. Then I got to read your Urgent Archives book, which is equally amazing, which is your conclusion earlier about what if is also uh, how you concluded the book. Uh, but my question is about, uh, it's somehow related to what Carl mentioned about artistic residencies. Yep. And I'm also coming from uh, a, a background of, uh, I also work in an archive as a research coordinator for uh, a nonprofit foundation that houses um, books, archival materials, ephemera, uh, artworks uh, of an art patron, and it's in Makati. And uh, coming from that perspective, uh, aside from archival interventions through artistic residencies, uh, are there uh, any other programming designed to invite outsiders to meaningfully interact with the archives, to look for unexplored narratives, or to make the general uh, advocacy of the archives known to the larger public? And if you could also tell us more about the artistic residency with, with SADA, like how yeah. it went, how you, is there any contract with the artists? Is there any uh, what, sorry? Uh, contract, like policy, contract, procedures. Contract, yes. Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, so yes, for the, the first artistic project we had is called um, Where We Belong, Artists in the Archive. And so I recommend looking, if you Google that, you'll find it on the SADA website, Where We Belong, Artists in the Archives. And that, that quote, Where We Belong, was actually a quote taken from some of the interviews that I had done with users of SADA, that they said SADA was a place where we belong, right? So, and that first project was really based on the symbolic annihilation research, right? So people saying, um, we need to counter the symbolic annihilation of South Asian Americans through new artistic reproductions, new artistic works. Um, one of the most incredible pieces that came out of that project was something called Lavan, L-A-V-A-A-N, which is a video work. So we had um, silent home movie footage in the archive of a wedding of an Indian immigrant to the United States from 19, the 1950s in Oklahoma. So this Indian immigrant who came to study chemical engineering at the University of Oklahoma married a white woman and we had silent home movie footage that his daughter had given us and we had digitized and put online. And one of the artists um, who um, uh, is is in a band that goes by the name Hamesha, Zain Alam is the artist's name, composed a score for the silent home movie footage. And then interspersed news footage about hate crimes against South Asian Americans in with this really beautiful silent home movie footage. So um, that project was funded by a grant from Pew, P-E-W is the name of the foundation. It actually opened up a new line of funding for the organization because 
Um, that foundation doesn't normally fund archives, but they do fund art. So we were able to you know, get that funding. And we have a contract with the artists. I believe it was a nine month long relationship where we met in person with the artists, we explored the archive with them, we talked about what they might be interested in doing, we paid them from this grant, and then we met nine months later in person where they unveiled their works of art publicly at a public forum that was attended by, I think, something like 100 people, mostly second generation South Asian Americans. And then also, as much as we could based on the work, the type of work that was produced, we made them digitally accessible. And then Samip created a conversation guide, the Where We Belong guide, and then used social media to really encourage people to come together in their homes, because we're a national organization, right? Um, to have conversations in their homes and view the digital forms of the art in their homes. Another example is that Samip had another grant to specifically um, create songs based on materials in the artwork, so commission musicians and composers. And there were a range of songs that were produced. There was a hip hop song, there was a jazz trumpet piece, there was an electronic music piece. And then Samip has created a walking tour in Philadelphia, which is where he is based, of sites that are important to South Asian American history. And he uses the songs to tell the story along the way of this walking tour. So not only did artists create these songs, but then people go tour the area and listen to the songs as they go. So that's one way of activating it. Um, but yes, it's important to pay people, right? So this is where foundation funding is really key. Um, and we have contracts with them. We meet in person. Um, we publicly unveil the works of art, um, but it's, it's a whole process. Can I have a follow-up follow on the contract? Um, can you tell us about the, the copyright part and if you allow selling of the artworks? Ah, good question. So here's where I think community archives are much more agile than dominant institutions. So um, when someone gives materials to SADA to be digitized, we don't have a strict deed of gift because they're not transferring property to us. We have a loan for duplication agreement, which means that they are um, bar lending us the materials. We're borrowing the materials, we agree to digitize them, and then we return them. So the owners of the materials, whoever has the copyright, retains the copyright but they grant the organization um, a non-exclusive right to reuse the materials any way the organization sees fit. So SADA can repurpose materials, for example, right, that someone has given. Um, there have been times where, for example, there was um, a Time Magazine news story from the 1960s about Dalip Singh Sound, the first Asian American congressman, Indian American congressman, sorry. Um, we don't have copyright to that, but we digitize it and put it online anyway, and if, you know, it's better to ask for forgiveness, right? So I think like we're not as strict as um, university archives might be, and I think we're more, we take more risks um, in that regard, right? Because if someone complained, we would just take it down, right? Thank you, Dr. Cashel. I hope you don't mind. We still have two sure. last two questions left. Yes, please. Our next question. I'm become... enjoying all these great questions. <laughs> They're really good. Great. Hello. My name is Aster. I'm a first-year student here in UPS Elias. My question starts first with a context. So in the Philippine context, where mis- and disinformation is a hot and problematic issue, people are constantly looking for correct and especially authoritative pieces and sources of information, especially in matters of our history, uh, in educational spaces, people are still looking for authoritative sources of information. So with this, how can we establish and empower community archives as legitimate sources of information, especially to reach more people in, in this society that we live, where there are active initiatives to silence those people and 
uh, also threaten them at, with terrorism or red tagging, you know. Another big question that I'm not sure I can answer. I think, you know, community archives work hard to have the trust of the communities that they serve and represent. As I said before, once you put something online, it's really hard. You can take measures to try to control how those materials are used, but ultimately, they're out there. So I would say um, being very careful about what is put online, because you know that what is put online can be used to generate deep fakes. It can be easily photoshopped, right? I mean, this is misinformation, disinformation are a massive problem in the United States, too, unfortunately, right? Um, but it goes down to, I think, building that trust within, within the community, right? So that it's funny to like come full circle and go back to this very um, almost conservative notion of archival authority, mm -hmm. right? But I think rather than like authority, it's trust, right? It's yeah. trust in the organization, trust in what the organization is doing. And that, of course, takes time. And it's also very hard to do online, yeah. too. So it's, I don't have a great answer to that question, but it's, I mean, it's a huge challenge. Yes, I, I understand. No. Thank you so much for the answer. And now, last but not the least. Hello, good morning. Um, I will be asking about paid internship. Yes. But first, I'll introduce myself. I'm Rose Marie Roque. You can call me Rose. Uh, well, I'm wearing our university shirt. I work at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, PUP. The, um, so I teach there. I am the, also the research chief of the Center for Heritage Studies. But I'm speaking here not about my work there, <laughs> but mainly as I label myself, if there's an independent filmmaker, I'm an independent <laughs> archival advocate. Um, my, that's the point of the query of paid internship because there's this advocacy that, that's why I very much uh, um, in a way relate and, and uh, am inspired with your talk, especially when you said about wearing many hats oh. it's because um, my advocacy work, I also plug in the administrative work in the university because I think being compliant and the slave to the requirements of government work <laughs> is very taxing if you just do and comply. So you put in what you are interested, what you're passionate about. So that is the question about the interns because we have interns and I engage them with the advocacy work since Archival advocacy and heritage studies, etc. Connect. It's interdisciplinary. So that's the point. Barra. The it's very different in, I mean, in other situations, especially um, with those with funding or. But so most of the our experience in the Philippines doing volunteer community work is really out of. We call it if you have. A, a, a pro bono work. There's pro abono work. Uh, <laughs> you like you abono is getting out of the the, the, uh, the expenses out of your pocket. Oh. So it's AKA personal funding. I mean whatever sugar coating you you say. It's mainly paying for your, uh, your what because you know the importance. No. And we have in a way survived that work combination of pro bono, pro abono, I mean, volunteer work, internship, etc. So it will always be different with the experiences, like when uh, first I heard the, the discussion of, yeah, paying the, so it, there is that automatic, I mean, difference. That's one difference. And another layer would be another entire thing of, yeah, being at risk, especially if you're working with um, not just marginalized uh, collection, but very political <laughs> collection. And um, that is, well, I won't be tackling that uh, much now, but the point is um, that complicates voluntary work. Um, because in the Philippines, it's not color, it's not just related to the skin color, 
or your race, but mainly our complication is we're also colored in the political color. Uh -huh. It complicates when you're labeled as Dilawan, pink, or red. And red uh, is being, depending on who uses red, it's activist, or the dominant in power now is also red. So, I mean, it complicates also the, the, the work. But going back to the question of paid internship and other things, yeah. how do you deal with it? And maybe we can, well, still maybe not 100% follow it because there's yeah. really a difference. Yeah. Or there shouldn't be a misjudgment about us that you're also enslaving people <laughs> for doing, I don't know, um, that kind of, you know, um, yeah, conflict? Yeah. Is that a conflict? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah. the conversation in the U.S. has shifted quite a bit in the past 10 years because of the advocacy and organizing of students, MLIS students, in general, against all kinds of unpaid internships. So they still certainly exist, and often it's the most wealthy, dominant institutions that expect students to do unpaid internships. But students have really been fighting back against that. So most universities that used to have policies that you had to complete an unpaid internship in order to graduate, most universities, not all, but most in the US have now gotten rid of those restrictions because we call it a race to the bottom, right? So the idea is like, oh, you can expect free labor from students, and then after they graduate, you can pay them less, and it just brings the entire profession down, right? Also, um, if students are required to do an unpaid internship to get their degree or to get experience, to get a job, who benefits from that? Well, it's wealthy students, right? Who are primarily also white students who can afford, because their parents are supporting them, to do unpaid work. And that's totally unfair. And over decades, over a century in the profession in the United States, um, archivists are, I think the last survey was 89% of professional archivists are white in the United States. It's, it's producing a profession that is not representative of the dynamics of the larger society and there's all kinds of implications about what gets preserved then and what, who's involved and what gets deemed valuable because of that. So I think paying interns is really important. A lot of the community archive sites are all volunteer run and they don't have any money to pay anybody, let alone a student intern. So um, six years ago, I approached the Mellon Foundation, which is a private foundation, with this problem. And I said, here are the problems, right? That um, students are expected to have professional experience before they graduate and to, in order to get jobs after they graduate. If this professional experience is meant to be unpaid, you're privileging the wealthiest students. If we're really interested in diversifying the profession, we need to pay students to do the work. Community archives need their work, right? Community archives have all sorts of projects that can benefit from um, labor that students can provide, but they don't have funding to fund the students. So the Mellon Foundation, again, has just been fantastic. They have funded these paid internships over the past six years. This is the last year of the grant that they have funded to do that. But the good news, even though that grant is ending, the Mellon said, that grant is ending, we want you to think bigger. So now I'm working with faculty at nine universities in the US and Canada to scale up this paid internship project at community archives across the US and Canada. We have an acronym, I have a colleague, Twee, who's really good at acronyms, so we are called FOCUS, Faculty Organizing for Community Archives Support. And we're all now working our deadline is coming up in the next few weeks to ask the Mellon Foundation for much more money to fund student intern interns at all of these other community archive sites. The Mellon is then using that also as a way to find out about community archives with the idea that they might also directly fund some of those community archives too. Um, also the curriculum needs to change too, so you can't train a student in the most you know, dominant diplomatics way of thinking about archives and then plop them into a community archive where they say you're doing it all wrong. Right? That's not helping anybody. So our curriculum needs to change. So part of that project is changing the curriculum as well and coming up with um, a resource to share syllabi and pedagogical exercises and all of that. Um, but that has been propped up by a foundation 
right? So I think it's a big question of like, how is this sustainable outside of foundation support? Yeah. And I think it depends on um, the financial health of the community archive. Like if community archives were fully funded, then they could fund their own paid internships, right? But they're not. So we have to advocate. Like that, that paid internship program is kind of a Band-Aid. We need to also think about a systemic solution where community archives are fully funded so that they can decide if it's useful for them to pay interns as well. But in general in the US, I think the conversation and the practice has shifted where we're really encouraging institutions and organizations to pay students at the MLIS level. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. That ends our open forum this morning. Thank you. Thank you so, so much to our attendees. And thank you so much for Dr. Caswell for answering the questions. Uh, very generously for, uh, for answering the questions. We are truly grateful for the insights and wisdom that you have shared with us this morning. And I'm sure that uh, many of our participants this morning have a lot to think about, about uh, regarding their community archiving initiatives. Now, to express our appreciation for our esteemed speaker, we would like to call on our Dean, Assistant Professor Rhea Rowena Apolinario, and this year's GAP Program Chair, Assistant Professor Jani Estermieda, to award the plaque of appreciation to our guest this morning. The plaque reads, University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies. This plaque of appreciation is awarded to Michelle Caswell, PhD, for being the resource speaker for the 44th Gabriel A. Bernardo Memorial Lecture Series with the theme Archives, Communities, and Liberatory Memory Work held on the 22nd of March 2024 at the Soler Auditorium, Bonifacio Hall, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City. Signed, Professor Jani Estermia, the Chair, 44th GAB Memorial Lecture Series, and Professor Rhea Rowena, you Apolinario, Dean UPSLIS. Now we are down to the last few portions of our program. Let us hear some closing remarks from Assistant Professor Jani S. Sermieda, the chair of the 44th Gabriel A. Bernardo Memorial Lecture Series. So, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, in conducting events like what we have today, we truly embody the spirit of connections and community with people. Who in, who in the process became our partners in making meaningful learning and experiences. As we conclude the 44th Gabriel Air Bernardo Lecture Series, I want to express our sincere appreciation to all those who have contributed to the success, to the success of this event. From the UP Main Library, headed by Ms. Elvi Rapus, uh, we would like to thank Mr. Ruel Rondilla, who designed our beautiful set for this morning. The UPSLIS Library, UPSLIS Administration staff, uh, office staff, and faculty who put up all the preparations, logistics, marketing, serve as MC, technical team, and companion of our guest speaker for the one week. Thank you very much. Thank you as well to the UP Office of International Linkages for the World Expert Lecture Series grant that made this lecture possible. And to our esteemed speaker, uh, guest speaker, Dr. Michelle Caswell, for being here with us and sharing your expertise, advocacy, and mission in empowering people and highlighting the importance of community, community participation in knowledge creation and preservation. And to our participants, all of you, we thank you for being with us today and being active learners and hopefully become champions in building community archives. Let us not end the learning here. We hope and, and look forward to the formative actions we can make and build based on what we have learned today. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you again in the 45th Gabriel Air Bernardo Memorial Lecture Series. Good morning. Thank you.
Maraming salamat po, Sir Johnny. Again, to all of our attendees this morning, thank you very much for joining us. And I hope that, sabi nga po ni Sir Johnny, you could start your own initiatives with your communities to archive what you have. If you enjoyed the lecture, you might be interested in our events and online content. To know more about us, visit our website at upslis.info. For past webinars and updates on our future events, please follow us on our social official pages, facebook.com slash UPSLIS and twitter.com slash UPSLIS. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash UPSLIS. And uh, let me just give an announcement regarding our graduate program admissions. Please watch out for announcements next week regarding the admissions calendar. We encourage you to apply in our graduate programs, Master of Library and Information Science, Master of Science in Library and Information Science, and the Master in Archives and Records Management. To cap off today's event, may we request everyone to stand as we sing UP Naming Mahal. That concludes our program this morning. Thank you very much to Dr. Caswell, to the organizers of this event, and to our attendees. You may approach our registration desk for certificates of participation and at appearance. Again, I am Elijah Darhuan, your MC this morning. Thank you again for joining us in this momentous occasion. Have a pleasant day, everyone. <laughs>